Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Renaissance with Celeste Gepetti, who's going to talk today about the move of intelligence from the cloud to the edge. So Celeste, for years the cloud was building up and everybody was focused on this is going to be the next wave. What's changed? Yeah, so several things have changed over the course uh, of the past decade. Uh, it began all with the move of intelligence, right, uh, in the cloud, which essentially led to companies such as NVIDIA and the accelerator companies getting a massive traction in the data center space. And what that led to was a move towards more AI-based workloads as opposed to CPU-intensive workloads that you had in the traditional data center operation. Together with that, what you find now is the workloads increasingly, right, where latency becomes a much bigger factor, move towards the end edge and then towards the endpoint. And what's driving it is the abundance of compute power at the edge or the endpoint of the network. And that is one of the biggest moves that we're seeing. And one estimate has it, there's going to be almost 30 billion or so devices by the end of 2023 at the end of the network with AI capabilities. Let's take a closer look. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. So, Lesh, what are we looking at here? So, this kind of graphically illustrates what we see happening in the marketplace with respect to the move of intelligence from the cloud to the endpoint. It all starts with embedded computing, whether it be MCUs or MPUs, which form the foundation of all intelligence at the edge or the endpoint. Above it, of course, the important layers which people often underestimate, which is the role of software, security, and the user experience. Those three factors play a very vital role in enabling the ease of use of emb embedded computing in a user environment. On top of it, one can think about the analog mixed signal capabilities that one builds on top, in particular, power, sensors, actuation, and connectivity. That's how the, em the embedded computing world connects to the cloud in order to process the data. Of course, with all of this, you need to have a common graphical user interface. And based on the applications, you drive uh, the system use and usage that goes into the marketplace. And two things are going on here, one of which is it just takes too long to send all this data up to the cloud. The second thing is there's a lot more data going on as, uh, in, in as well, right? Because Correct. now you have all these sensors. Correct. And, and, and there, we start to see a very important uh, role being played, for example, in a couple of different ways. First is the role of the compute at the lowest power. That's the number one. And the second thing that's also happening that's driving that trend is increasingly there's a move towards tiny machine learning as well as embedded AI that starts to play a role in the embedded computing world. So you now have CPUs that have the capability for doing some level of AI processing. In addition to it, you have embedded AI by way of neural processing units that can be embedded together with MCUs and MPUs to drive the growth of intelligence at the edge. And when you think about an MPU or an MCU, this is not the same MCU or MPU that we saw five years ago too, right? That's correct. So the MCUs and the MPUs of yesteryear, you didn't particularly care about the capabilities of moving workloads into that environment. Increasingly, as the intelligence is moving towards the endpoint, the factors which start to matter are latency to process those workloads quickly, the ability to have security. Security is becoming a very important aspect. And then the third thing is the software capabilities that are brought on board to enable this embedded computing environment to do what is needed to be done in the applications in question, right? So that's kind of what has changed. The application space is starting to widen much more uh, relative to what we had to do, say, five years ago or a decade ago.
And also when you think about what went on in the past, the real compute power came out of a box. Now it's much more distributed than what it was, and you're really trying to send all this data around much more than you ever were before. In the past, it was all, this stays in the box. Now it's everywhere. Correct. So as the intelligence gets distributed, which is kind of what you're uh, referring to, the role of connectivity starts to become much more important in that particular environment. Because what you then see uh, is the ability, whether it's a sensor-based network in the field that needs to connect to the cloud, or something that has to be done locally, the ability to be able to process it starts to become far more important. So there's this vague area in between, which is now we call it the edge, but really it stretches from the endpoint all the way up to the cloud. What is that starting to look like? Are you getting any form out of this, or is it still this, this murky area? Increasingly, right, the cloud is being defined by large workloads. For example, whether it's weather forecasting, whether it's processing massive amounts of insurance claims or so on. Uh, but other kinds of workloads that typically used to be handled in the cloud, for example, facial recognition, or whether it happened to be voice processing, sophisticated voice processing, material would be processed in the cloud. Increasingly, what you're finding is a lot of those workloads are being simplified, and you can do processing pretty much of the camera itself, like you have today, or in the case of wake and voice features, and simple phrase recognition is increasingly all done at the ed endpoint or the edge. So that's where, where latency is becoming a bigger and bigger factor. You're finding a lot of those workloads being offloaded to the edge or to the endpoint. We've done a lot of work in the past in terms of power uh, performance. Is that now being applied into the edge and does that buy us something that we didn't have before? Certainly. I mean, look, there are, there's always going to be a move towards lower and lower power consumption at the edge or the endpoint, right? You obviously can't have the kind of data center power consumption levels being handled at the edge or at the endpoint of uh, the network. So the, the, the item that really starts to become much more relevant uh, in this particular regard is the power consumption. And you could range, and that can range all the way from pure energy harvesting, right, uh, which, would, which would be relevant in certain instances, to battery lives of 10 years or beyond uh, for, say, a very low power consuming Bluetooth device, right, to a few milliwatts kind of range for simple microcontrollers uh, that starts to play a role in the marketplace. So power is a very important factor. And I would say the single most important factor today the way you should look at the edge or the endpoint is really the ability to do massive amounts of computing at the lowest power. That's the way to think about it. And when I say compute, I just don't mean CPU intensive functions, but actually functions that are much more workload related or workload specific that start to matter. And that's where power becomes uh, an important uh, differentiator. One of the big challenges here is that you're trying to partition and also prioritize. Mm -hmm. So now you've got to dissect this, this massive amount of data moving around and saying, okay, what are we trying to do with this? What's the best way to deal with this? How do you go about doing that? And where do people typically go wrong? The biggest challenge in, when it comes to the partitioning of, of data is, right, what would make sense to partition and what does not make sense to partition, right? As long as you're able to get that distinction for the kind of workloads that are needed, I just gave you earlier a couple of examples on certain features that might make sense uh, to handle on the endpoint. And a great example is really voice, right? Because you could have features uh, that, that are key phrases that can be handled at the endpoint very well. But if it's natural language processing, more often that's still better to be running on the cloud, although that's changing to some extent. But that would be a great example of where the different kinds of partitioning would occur. For example, earlier on, wake on voice was the very basic feature that got moved to the endpoint, right? Now you have key phrases. Now you have a little bit more processing capability. Then you ha the amount of phrases that are being handled becomes a little bit different. Uh, and so on. So eventually you'll get to natural language processing pretty much at the endpoint, and that's kind of what you have to go after. One of the key factors here is that everything really has to be connected now too, and connected in ways that it wasn't in the past. That affects power 
affects performance. It also affects how you're going to design these systems, right? Correct. And that's a good point. I mean, I, the way connectivity becomes very, very important uh, because for a couple of factors. First is for the processing of data if it can be handled locally, right? And the second question is when you have a bunch of sensor networks that are remote somewhere out in the fields, assume, right? Then you need a mode of connectivity to be able to integrate that data and send it to a central unit where you can start to do something with the data, massage the data, do it in analytics, and so on. So the mode of connectivity becomes very important in this regard. Uh, you know, a Bluetooth is the simplest example of what one would want to find, right? Uh, where you have a device, uh, say, that's monitoring uh, your heart rate your, or your uh, SpO2 levels, and then connecting it to your smartphone. Very simple example, right? Uh, and increasingly, those features are being integrated into the phone today. But you could have, you could visualize a scenario where you get a bit more accurate reading, if you will, of the heart rate and the SpO2 and put it in the, uh, uh, connect it to your phone. So we have examples like that where you have a finger clip that's connecting to your phone and you start to take a look at that data. So that's a simple example of Bluetooth. A great example, on the other hand, where you have the only mode of communication would be cellular, right, also exists, where you would need something like a CAT1 solution, where you're sitting in a farm, which is no easy access to Wi-Fi or anything of that sort. There you need to have some kind of cellular connection. So that's the other extreme. And in between, you have everything, right, from the very short range where you have NFC, all the way to Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, UWB, and then you have Y-Sun, and eventually you get into the, uh, into the cellular space. And even within cellular, based on whether you want to have limited amount of data being transmitted, where you have NB-IoT, or you have more chunks of data being transmitted, uh, such as you know, whether it's CAT1 through all the way to CAT4, or uh, CAT-M solutions, you have a variety there uh, based on what you want to do. But so what, what is, starts to matter in that environment is given that the radios consume the most amount of power, right, in a typical scenario, you have to be very, very mindful. And there, the move is much more from silicon germanium-based RF devices to RF SOI and eventually to RF CMOS-based devices at the most, more advanced nodes to drive power consumption. The big challenge that comes in here now is you have to control all this stuff. And so now your control functions become much more sophisticated than they did in the past, right? Correct. <clears throat> and what you'll find, right? So suppose, as an example, to, to the point that you brought up earlier, the thing that starts to matter in that particular environment is how do you partition the data between what the CPU does and what typically a baseband function would have done in the past, right? So now you can increasingly see a CPU performing some of the software functions that used to be handled typically by a baseband uh, before, right? So now you just have to do a radio function and say a processor function, which handles just about everything uh, that wasn't the case before. So now you, you have the ability to partition the RF and the subsequent processing differently than you did before. We have a lot more sensors that are coming in now as well, and those sensors are themselves getting smarter too, right? Yeah. How does that affect the whole design? Yeah, whether it's the most basic sensors that are looking at things like temperature, humidity, um, and say uh, pressure and so on that are ubiquitous today, or whether it's more complex sensors that are looking at things like PM2.5, uh, looking at other functions like flow and so on, uh, the, the, again, in the sensor case, the workload and what it ends up doing determines how much processing needs to be done locally and how much needs to be handled centrally, right? So sensor networks, whether it's measuring soil, uh, soil pH levels or anything of that sort, right, are becoming co more complex by definition, right? We have the ability then uh, locally today, for example, to handle a certain level of processing. But when, when you're trying to gather, say, a data across a field or across a warehouse of some sort, then it becomes a little bit more complex where you start to add connectivity to the sensors. And that's where the environment, the overall sensors and sensor network environment is evolving. 
based on how many data points are you trying to collect, over what area, and the relevance of whether it can be handled locally or it needs to be handled on a cloud is what starts to matter. And from a processing perspective, that has major ramifications. Because by their very nature, right, CPUs tend to be very much single-threaded. <clears throat> so increasingly, right, uh, you could go to a multi-threaded CPU, but then you drive the cost of the system up quite aggressively. So one of the things that we've been taking a look at, for example, is to see if an FPGA-type scenario can be moved into this environment, because an FPGA, by its very definition, allows for multi-threading, right? But the problem with FPGA is, of course, the cost and the complexity of the software gets to be intense. So we've taken the tact that we can, for very small uh, number of gates and for very specific workloads with, say, less than 1,000 or 2,000 lookup tables, that you can design an FPGA with very low standby current that's multi-threaded and very easy to use for even the unsophisticated people by, by using something like a schematic capture uh, kind of solution, software solution, to a more complex uh, environment like Verilog, which can be used by the more sophisticated users. But the idea there is cost. It's all driven by cost. So if you can get the cost to less than a dollar, you'll be in very good shape uh, to compete effectively against a multi-core uh, CPU. Celeste Chittapetti, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed. Good to have you here today.